First question I ask you is the easiest one I'm gonna ask you all day long. Your name is? Virginia Sandona. And how do you spell your name, please? Uh, all the whole thing? Just the last part. S-A-N-D-O-N-A. -N -N and is that your maiden or married name? Married name. And your maiden name? Larson. L-A-R-S-O-N. O-N. O -N. O -N. Mm -hmm. And where and when were you born? I was born in Roslyn on May 24th, 1930. So you are a true Roslynite. I am a true Roslynite, as were my parents. Oh, really? They were both born in Roslyn. Oh, wow. So you can go back to Roslyn for about 100 years? Uh, yeah, over 100. Over 100 years? Over 100. Oh, wow. I think my grandparents came in 1903 and uh, they established a home there. They later moved to Tacoma, but they were here. Well, my aunts and that were being born and that kind of thing. My mother, yeah, they were all born in Roslyn. Did your parents, uh, what, English descent or where do you, where did your parents hail from before Roslyn? Uh, they came from England. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Huh. Wow, that's interesting. England to Roslyn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my grandmother always said that if she had known that she would, that she was going to have to stay in Roslyn, she would never have come to, the, to this country anyway. She assumed they were going to come and hit it rich and, you know, two years, go back to England with all their money. <laughs> well, it didn't, didn't work that way. Uh, what was it like growing up as a little girl in Roslyn? It was fun. It was fun. You, you, you knew everyone in town and, and all that kind of stuff, and there wasn't any such things as drugs. We never heard of drugs and that type of thing. We'd play under the arc light, we called it, out in front of the house. They, they had to, some different system in them, and they called them arc light. Something had to spark for, for the to and we'd play hide and seek and all the fun games you know and and the whistle would blow at nine o'clock and we'd all scoot for home the, the the lamp was right across from my streets my house so i didn't have very far to go and the whistle was which whistle your parents whistle or was there yeah no a, a, uh the town whistled oh. at, at eight o'clock oh really at oh. eight o'clock there was a, a whistle i i think maybe it was partly to make sure that the fire alarm worked and that kind of thing, and, and let kids know it's time to go home. Huh. I, I don't think anything happened to us if we didn't go home. Because yeah. we had, in Olympia, we had the brewery whistle, and it went at 8 in the morning, 12, 12, 30, 1, 1, 30, and 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then if there was a fire for the right. volunteer fire department. Right, yeah, that's what we had, a volunteer fire department. Do you, do you remember as a girl growing up, did you ever have dreams of what you wanted to be when you grew up? Grew up. Yeah, I wanted to be a nurse. And I, I, when I think back now, I don't think it was myself as much as my mother. Because every time somebody said, what you going to be? It was a nurse. And of course, she backed me up because she, she thought I would be a nurse. But I went to nursing school and it was not for me. I wasn't there in probably two months. And I, that it just, nothing, nothing about it was for me. And so I quit. Dropped out of school. My parents were disappointed, of course. I was going to the Virginia Mason. And uh, then I came home and I worked in a bank, the Roslyn Bank, for a while. And then I got on at the telephone company in, in uh, Clay Elm here. And the old, the old switchboard that's in that museum was the ones that we worked. So, oh, wow. And I was there for quite a while. Then I married and we moved to Ellensburg. And then we were down there for six years and we moved back to Clay Elm. Been here ever since. My husband was also born in Clay Elm. I mean, in Clay Elm, and his mother was born in Roslyn. Oh, wow, wow. So well, that's nice to have good roots in the... He, go to the cemetery, even my great-grandparents are buried up here in Roslyn. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. Wow, yeah. wow. See, I love families that have a history like that. I know a lot of people that don't have a history like that anymore because they're just kind of vagabonds. I mean, their family's mm -hmm. moved. And, mm -hmm. uh, was being a nurse, was that a common thing of girls of that era? Uh, well, there were three of us in my class that were going, going to go. And one of them never, never did at all. And the other one did, did finish her nursing school. She was from a huge family of, I think, 14 kids. And I don't think you had much choice once you started, you were going to finish. Uh, the, the older brothers would make sure that the money was there and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, she did finish. It's interesting because my other producer, Ken, and I were just talking about how history, because as I've done this, uh, these interviews, my perception of history has changed a lot from what history books have written in them, to, in some 
extent because uh, history books uh, come back and say prior to World War mm -hmm. II, women were going to be teachers and nurses, and that was all that was open to them out there, basically. Yeah, that, that's more or less what it was. You know, of course, there was no such thing as computers or that type of thing. And women certainly weren't in the business world. You didn't hear the, a woman president of a bank like you do now or running for Congress or whatever. It was just or ladies. Someone said, did, asked me this not too much or very long ago. Did, did I feel that I lived, the part of town I lived in from the other part of town, did I feel comfortable with the kids from the other part of town? And I, well, yeah, they, they were all in the same boat. Their dads worked in the mines and mothers stayed home. So what was there to be excited about, you know? I, I don't remember any feeling. Of, everybody was equal in the classroom. There was none of this, who's got the best brand of jeans, or of course you couldn't wear jeans, you had to wear dresses. <laughs> did, what, was your dad a miner or what did you Yes, do? my dad was a miner for 43 years. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. All in this area? Then? Yes. He worked at several mines. The one I remember from my days was old, uh, number three in Roslyn, old number three. And then he was injured, and uh, and then he picked up black lung, which so many of them did. He died at, he was only 73 when he died, which is young nowadays. And, yeah. What would your mom do? My mom was a housewife. That was it. She, she never had a job, ever. I All of years... That I well I knew her for she died in uh, 2000 and she had never had a job she was 90, 94 when she died yeah she but we did a lot of she did all the canning and you always no matter how hot the weather was you had a hot meal for your husband when he came home the kitchen would be stifling <laughs> but the hot meal was on the table for the husband who had worked in the coal mines all day so I know again it's interesting how. Uh, the women's movement gave this perception, like you said, oh, my mother never worked, um, never worked outside the house. Your mother worked pretty hard. I mean, just like you oh, described. Absolutely. I mean, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You bet. Take care of everything. Make sure the, all the mine clothes. The, the guys, when they went to the mine on Monday morning, they took clean clothes. And then they left them up there. And then they went to the mine and put on the dirty clothes and then come back. And then at the end of the week, they'd bring them home, and then you'd wash them over the weekend in the, in the old washer with a ringer on it and all that kind of stuff. So most most people had two sets so that you didn't have to wash so quickly over the weekend. You know, you had a little extra time there. But it was basically bib overalls. And yeah. My dad was a mine boss, um, fire boss, they called him. And he went down in the mines before the miners did, and inspected the mines for gas. And he had a lantern. They, they talk, and they, they, one time they would go in with a canary. The canary dropped, the mine was wrong. Well, he had a lantern, I have it at home. It's about this long, about that big. And you could tell by the flame in it if they were running out of air. So that he would set the fans a different way or close that part of the mine down or, or what, whatever it needed to be done before the miners got there. So he was, by like 11 o'clock in the morning, he was home already. Because he had his, his had his day in. He walked miles and miles and miles in the mine. Wow. Yeah, there were there were two guys that did did it every day. Yeah. How many children were in your family? My brother and myself. And were you the baby or the older? No, I'm. The, uh, he was older. He was four and a half years older. It, it's interesting because um, we'll talk about Pearl Harbor on the coast. Pearl Harbor was real relevant because everybody thought they were going to fly it over the coast. Do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor here in Roswell? Uh, well, I remember the day that it happened, because that's what they, you know, with Jack Rabbit Hunt and, and such. But uh, it, I was 11, and the war didn't mean a, an awful lot. It, it, was, it was somewhere else. You know, but I, I know that we had to uh, put the uh, stuff on the blinds so that you, we'd have a blackout at night so they couldn't see the town and all that kind of stuff. And of course, the stuff was all rationed. And that's like my mother who canned had a heck of a time getting sugar to can. And uh, the, as kids used to try to, they'd have a rubber drive to uh, offset. The, they needed the rubber to make other things with. And a couple of kids and I, we knew there was a real old tire about a mile, mile into the woods in a crit. 
And we decided we had to get that. It was a huge thing. And we rolled it all the way to town, and we took it to where we were supposed to take it, and they didn't have a scale big enough to weigh it. So they said, well, you have to go up to the, you know, the drugstore. Had a, used to always have a scale in the middle of, of the entry there. You know, you put your penny in. So we put our penny in and weighed the scale and pushed a little bit on the, t <laughs> on the tire. We took it back and told them how much it was, and I think we got like 74 cents or something like that. A, a whole day of work for three, three kids. But we were excited. Oh. Was that an adventure, or even as an 11-year-old, was there a patriotic feeling to what it, you did? It was patriotic, we, yeah. But of course, we were after the money as much as the patriotism and that. But I don't remember uh, my, my brother, who was four and a half years older than me, and he, was the, uh, he went in the services at 17. They, he went into what they call a V-12 program, and it was to train officers. He was pretty pretty smart kid. And he went in there, and then he had some uh, problems with his legs, so he didn't, he, they didn't advance him for a while. He stayed in a hospital, more or less, in Kansas someplace. And then they sent him to Notre Dame for his education. He was in the Navy for five years and never saw a ship. So he was never in danger. I guess you're in danger anywhere, but I mean, as far as the war, he was not on a battleship or anything like that. I had a cousin in Ellensburg, a, not a first cousin, but a second cousin, who was killed in the invasion of Normandy, but that's the other part of the war. So, so as a little girl, were you aware of really what war was? Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't remember feeling threatened that they were going to come and get us. Uh, in fact, I, I, my husband and I were talking about it yesterday when they blew the 9-11. I, I think in my mind, I still thought in order for them to invade us, they'd have to come marching up the shore or something. You know, never, never thought what, they could take airplanes and ruin us like that. That was a shock for me. But uh, Pearl Harbor, by the time I'm 14 or so in high school, well, then some of these boys are coming home on leave in their uniforms and well, that was exciting. It was more of a pleasurable thing than, than, than a worry. So, which is interesting because there is that, there is an exciting element to it. Yes, there is. You know, because mm -hmm. I assume that, uh, of course, in your grade, they weren't old enough to go yet. But the older classes, a lot of the young boys were gone. Oh yeah, yeah. Several out of our class had gone on, not to not to Pearl Harbor, but as it went on, they didn't finish their education, and then they come back. Most of them got their diplomas handed to them because they, they just didn't know what to do at the time for these kids that were going off to work. There, there was well, the one family in Roslyn that had uh, nine, nine kids in the service at the one time. Wow. Two, two girls, I think, and the rest boys, and they all came home, and they all saw action. So, wow. yeah, it, it, I, well, we, there wasn't television, so you weren't getting this in your face every night like you are now, you know, so you, you didn't really know as a kid as much going on. Where you'd get your information was when you went to the show on Friday night and they would have a newsreel and it would show the bombings and soldiers marching and that kind of thing. And that was, I, it was an interesting part of the show to us. But uh, I don't remember sitting down and reading a newspaper on it or anything. I probably did somewhat after I read the funnies or, so, <laughs> or something. Where, where was the theater that you would go to to see the newsreels? In Roslyn? It was in Roslyn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it burnt down. Oh. Now, your dad, I assume, was probably too old for the service. Uh, much yes, lower he, was, he was right between. He was born in 1903, so he was 15 at the... 1918 one, and then he too old for the one in 41, so. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was it a big uh, a town affair when the soldiers came back on leave? I mean, because. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was we, did you see such and such downtown today? And they, they, they'd often go back to the school just to see their old friends and teachers and that, so we would see them a lot that way. And you knew them all. 
because of the small town. I mean, it wasn't a matter of like, well, who was that guy? You, you knew who they were. <coughs> and sometimes they'd, they'd go to our school dances and that kind of thing. And that was always exciting to have somebody there in uniform. Uh, That's where, as I said, it is interesting uh, when you look at um, history books and how they portray it. Because there, there was a war going on over there. Uh, and even within that, a lot of the people that I talked not a lot, but a number of the people that I talked to, it actually was kind of a tourist vacation for them. They yeah. saw the world. Uh -huh. Right. You know, there was a war going on, but they described being a tourist in Europe. Mm -hmm. you, know, you bet. If they weren't in a hard action, it was probably a pretty good treat for them. Yeah. Huh. War is an awful thing, though. I don't like this going on now in Iraq and Iran since I have a grandson that's 17, and that makes a difference, too. Yeah, it is amazing how that <clears throat> changes the mm -hmm. perspective. Of yes, it does. Yeah. Do you think there, there was a different attitude in World War II than there is today towards what's going on? Yeah, I do. It's so much politics nowadays, and it seemed like we were going to war, and we were going to war. That was it. I don't remember there being, of course, we were bombed, so we almost had to go to war. I mean, we didn't have much choice on that one and, uh, and such. But, uh, yeah, you, you just kind of went along with what the, the government said. You, you felt that they were making the right decisions for the country, not like now with all the stuff that's going on. It makes me sick. <laughs> and I assume it's interesting because that's, that is, I mean, I grew up that way, you, what the government said. You know, that was it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was, I assume that was a somewhat secure feeling in World War II, that you felt things were being taken care of. Even yeah, so. right, right, definitely. Huh. Yeah. So you continued on. Did, did school change during the war? I mean, did you have to adjust classes, or did life no. kind of for young girls, young boys and girls? No, I don't remember there being hardly any changes, except that when they got close to 18, they were all being taken away in the services they didn't have they had didn't have much choice that kind of a thing but uh as far as the girls i don't know we just went about our business i guess and a lot of us wrote to kids in the services and and things like that it was fun to get letters from them kids that you knew and uh, so was that through the school you did that or no it, on, on our own more or less I, it might have been done through the school some of it but mostly it was just because you knew it was such and such as brother or such and such that you'd write to them. Yeah, it was fun. Do you remember what types of things you would write in order? Because you're what, 11, 12, 13 now? And oh, mostly about what was going on at school or somebody's going with somebody and that, that just kid stuff, you know. But uh, I, don't, I don't remember writing much about, about the war itself. I think I think we more or less stayed away from that to try to keep things more on the upbeat side. And, and at that time, you were writing because you were fairly young. You were writing as a as a pen pal versus uh, yes. a, a, say a seventeen year eighteen year old thing. Oh, I'm writing a hot soldier. Yeah, right. So it was a, there was an innocence to it. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. And then there, as we got older, of course, the Pearl Harbor part of it was over, but. I mean, the war went on for a long time this way and that way. And then you, then you had some with some real romances in them. I know there was one boy that I wrote to, and he uh, brought me different things from, he was in Japan after the war, and he brought me some little trinkets, little dolls and things like that. When he, he still lives here too. <laughs> He's a good friend of ours. Huh. Yeah. It's interesting because, again, everybody, whether they realize it or not, was a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I mean, even this young girl writing these soldiers had to be an important contribution to uh, what was going oh, we, on. Yeah, we felt that it was. Yeah. And then make sure, it, it, at times, you'd send them, like try to get cookies or something to them, but that that didn't work very well because they would be stuck on a ship for, for months. And I remember well after, what must be during the Korean War, that. Uh, my husband's cousin was there, and we used to send food to him, like salamis and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't 
anything to do with the first war, the World War. But, uh, it, it's interesting again how much uh, times have changed because if I were a parent and have an 11 year old daughter, I, I don't think I could uh, <laughs> imagine her writing soldiers. And no, no, it, it, times have changed. Of course, often it was someone that was lived down the street and you knew their parents as well and that kind of a thing. So it wasn't like it's a stranger. It would be someone that you knew pretty well. And in a little town like that, you knew everyone. It's interesting because, again, the way history books had painted things, it was there were these sex-crazed soldiers and there were these young women chaining them. But you know what? I've talked to so many of them, and I said, what did you write about? And they would say, we wrote about everyday life. Mm -hmm. And they said it was so nice to hear. I mean, things like... You know, mom was mowing the lawn today. Yeah, right. We went down to the drugstore and uh -huh. Fred was pulling sodas, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's that's more or less what we wrote about. Maybe during this the seasons of basketball, who was winning the games? You know, we beat Ellensburg or whatever. Because in, in my high school days, we played Ellensburg, which is a class, what, four now? Class 4A. It, there was, we played Ellensburg. We played Yakima, Wenatchee. And now this, our, our school isn't any smaller, I don't think, but the other ones are so much bigger. Would you do um, patriotic pep rallies? Was there a, a school effort to get behind the war effort? Or? Hmm. There were things, but I, I can't think what it would be now. Hmm. I don't That's know. escaping me. But uh, yeah, but I, I, I do know that we were all behind the soldiers and there was different things done and, and that kind of stuff. But I, I don't, I can't put my th finger on one thing. Yeah. Do you remember if in the classroom did they teach about the war? Not really. It, it, your, your history was old history, stuff that doesn't matter, you know, when Magellan got here and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> So, uh, no, I don't remember it that much in, in school. Again, it shows how much of a time. I mean, today, they turn on CNN in the classroom and they're watching the wars that's happening exactly. and they're discussing it. Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, I talked to a lot of people when Pearl Harbor got bombed. The, the, there were two responses. Oh, my goodness, Pearl Harbor's been bombed. And the second one was, where's Pearl Harbor? Yeah, right, right, yeah. Because times were just so, so different. Uh -huh. I know we came home that night. Of course, we didn't have well, we had a radio, but it wasn't on. And, and a cousin of mine came past the house, and she said, "Did you hear what happened today?" And uh, we said, "She said, I don't know. She said the Japs did something." So then we turned my folks turned on the radio to find out about it. But of course, you called them Japs in those days. <laughs> but uh, and that's our first inkling of, of the war. Of course, it was a surprise to everybody, so. Was there uh, any uh, Japanese community in, in Roswell? None. None. Wow. I don't think there is yet. I, I really doubt there's any Japanese up there yet. There's some Koreans and things like that, I think, but I don't know about the Japanese. But, uh, they're all fine people. and. I often wonder what they think of when they go to, when the Japanese go to Pearl Harbor and see the ship they sunk and, and all that kind of stuff. We've been on it several times and we'd, we'd look at the Japanese and wonder, what are they thinking? It's a whole two generations ago, but they must be, have some feelings when they see that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because again, perspective of history books, mm -hmm. um, they felt they were Again, uh, when you take it down on to, to an individual level, they were defending, fighting for their country, we were fighting for our country, whether it be in Europe or South Pacific, down on the individual exactly. level. Somebody said, you know, they said really wars are not about the individuals, they're about a few people up top mm -hmm. or some secondary, you know, we're dealing with the oil issue, right. things like that. So. Yeah. Oh, I think that's definitely true. This oil over there, we got to find something else besides the need of oil. And I, if we can put on a man in the moon, we should be able to do it. <coughs> was your um, the, your husband, 
was from this area. Mm -hmm. um, older than you, younger, same Two age. years. Two, two years, years older. older. So did he end up in the service? He ended up in the services. But that was uh, right after high school. So he was two years ahead of me. We, we knew each other in high school, but we didn't. We hadn't dated in high school. So he wasn't your sweetheart when he went into the, mm -mm. Into the service? No, when he came out. <laughs> he hadn't been out very long when we met at a dance. and. Now, we've been married almost 51 years. Wow. Oh, in May. He's Catholic, I'm Episcopalian. We're married by a Baptist on Friday the 13th. Well, you know what they say about us Episcopalians, wherever you find four, you'll always find a fifth. But, but I'm, <laughs> so, um, old joke. Um, uh, so did you, when he came, you met him at a dance, like a, like a USO dance, or just was this totally separate from? Uh, yeah, just. They had dances almost every Saturday night at the different halls, the Eagles Hall. They, they weren't, they didn't serve liquor in those days. It, they had this big hall, and so there was dances on different occasions. And there'd be there was one at the Masonic Hall in Roslyn, and and for two bucks or whatever it was, you got in the dance. And they had live bands always, and so. So was he in uniform at that time, or mm -mm, out of he was out of uniform? Out of uniform, mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. Yeah. He was in the Marines in, in uh, San Diego because that was after the war. Which is interesting because did you, was that a part of your life you had to deal with when you got married or was more something that uh, as far as in, in newlyweds and starting life became something of the past? Um, I don't know. Most of the girls that I know that married soldiers and sailors coming home didn't know them before the war, and they were an awful lot of them, the, the soldiers or servicemen, were a lot older than than the girls they married, you know, seven, eight years, and that, that type of thing. They picked up all these cuties just coming out of high school, and yeah. But did you discuss the war ever, or was that just a part of your life that that was a past thing? And I suppose it was discussed at times, but mostly, mostly we probably discussed that such and such boy got sent to Iwo Jima or such and such and that type of thing, more so than the bits of the war itself. Where was your husband during the war? Do you know where he was? Was he South Pacific or no? State My husband? Yeah. No, he he just went to the he just went to San Diego with the Marine Corps. Oh, so that's his, he didn't he. He was two. like my dad. He never ended up having to go over. He got his two years in and split. Yeah, okay. Yeah, had, yeah. 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 Which makes it easier because that's, I thought he'd gone over. That's why I was asking. Because no. some people, because their husband had been over, now they get back together and they're, there were, today we call it post traumatic. But, so you didn't have to deal with any of that. No, did. no. Uh -huh. But the, there were, you know, some of these girls, they were gone for sometimes four years. These kids, so a lot of marriages were pretty shaky when they first come back because they, they, they remembered what was before and it wasn't quite as easy. Because uh, it sounds like everybody changed um, with the war. I mean, you have young boys going away to war and coming back young men. You have young women going into service. You have young women staying home. Mm -hmm. You have young women going into the workforce. Right. Which is hard probably for you to answer the question. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Do you think life changed if you look at prior to World War II and post-World War II for what your life would be? I don't, I don't remember being an awful lot different. It, it was nice that we didn't have to wait to, in, to get uh, sugar or gasoline or, or whatever, that kind of stuff. When that was over, that seemed like a real real treat. We have a, a cabin at Lake Ketchies, which we, my parents had and I, I have it now. And we spent an awful lot of time up there where there was no radios or anything. And anytime my dad wasn't working, we were at the cabin on the lake and that kind of thing. So I probably missed a lot of st stuff going on in town with that too. But stuff, we still had the cabin after the war, it was before the war. so. It didn't make much difference there. Huh. Yeah, I, I was just a little bit on the young side to remember it, it affecting me very much. 
at 11, 12, 13, 14, and you, you don't think too much about that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, uh, it's all a matter of perspective. For you, it was exciting to see these young men in uniform. Oh, absolutely. Back. I still get a, I still like to see a young man in uniform. They look sharp and yeah, and they, they seem sure of themselves and, and whatever, and I think it's nice. I still like to talk to them. I don't know that many anymore, but when when we have, we, we've enjoyed it. Huh. Yeah. Did you stay in the house, or did you go out and work in the outside of the house after the war? Uh, well, see, I didn't graduate until 48, and then I worked for the bank in Roslyn for a short while, and then then the telephone company. And I worked there for about nine years, and two years. We were married in 55, and then in 57, he, he was with Standard Oil. And he was transferred to Ellensburg, so we moved to Ellensburg, so then I quit my job. And I never worked again. Which, my husband keeps saying, how much money would we have if you had worked all those years? But we had two little kids or and whatever, and that was kind of what women did. Later on, when we came back to Clay Elm in 63, we, uh, we bought out uh, a beer distributor. So I did drive truck, but I never got paid for it. What brand? Budweiser. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, my name, uh, my great-grandfather was the founder of uh, Olympia Brewing Company. Olympia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, when, uh, when we first took over, which was 65, uh, Olympia was number one in the state. Rainier was number two. Well, we didn't have Olympia, but we had Rainier. And Budweiser was just nothing, absolutely nothing. But they, somebody who knew the beer business better than we did, not been in it very long, they said, whatever you do, don't get rid of that franchise. Hang on to it. Well, it's a good thing because Olympia and Rainier are both gone. <laughs>